the Advancing Women in Agriculture Conference is celebrating its 10th year anniversary of bringing women in ag together to listen, learn, network, and grow. The next conference will be held on November 19th through 21st, 2023 at the Sheraton Falls in Niagara Falls, Ontario. Join in on hearing over 25 expert speakers and role models from the egg and food sector that will provide you with inspiration, motivation, and new tools to help you succeed in your personal life, in your operation, or career. For more information or to register, visit advancingwomenconference.ca forward slash 2023 east or head to the link in today's show notes. Hi, I'm Caitlin Dubin, and this is the Rural Woman Podcast. I'm a first-generation farmer who married into agriculture. Born and raised in a city, I was so unfamiliar with where my food came from, but I was determined to figure it out. Through my journey into agriculture, I saw women who were strong but humble, often taking a back seat. To me, these women were leaders who deserved a seat at the table. I created the Rural Woman Podcast to share the voices of women in an industry whose stories often went untold. The rural entrepreneurs who live and breathe their work, full of grit and pride. We come here to share our stories, to be in community with each other, to be challenged and inspired, but most importantly, to be celebrated and to be heard. We may not all live, farm, ranch or homestead the same, but we are all connected. We are rural women and our stories are worthy of being told. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Rural Woman Podcast. Today you'll meet Laurel Isabart. Laurel is a first-generation cattle rancher living in southern Ontario with her husband and two children. She is passionate about using her platform to advocate for agriculture, mental health, and social justice. She operates her farm store, The Mercantile, at Isabart Acres on her ranch and online. She is also a photographer and the host and creator of the Chore Beer Chats podcast. I am very excited for you to get to meet my good friend, Laurel, who I have had the privilege and honor of working with podcast coaching for her podcast, the Chore Beer Chats podcast, as well as meet in real life and can call her a good friend. Be sure you check out the Chore Beer Chats podcast wherever you listen to the Rural Woman podcast, as I am one of the guests of her second season, and I cannot wait for you to hear that. As well, obviously, talking to Laurel is a really great time, and we recorded an extended episode of the Rural Woman Podcast uh, for the patrons of the Rural Woman Podcast over on Patreon. So be sure if you would like to hear the extended version of our chat, you can head to today's show notes to learn more about how you can become a patron through Patreon and support the show and the stories of women in agriculture to be shared. Without further ado, my friends, let's get to this week's episode with Laurel. Laurel, welcome to the Rural Woman Podcast. How are you today? I'm so good. Thank you for having me. I'm so nervous. Why are you nervous? Well, this is the Rural Woman Podcast. It's kind <laughs> of a big deal. <laughs> it's just two girlfriends having a cup of coffee after we've taken our Vivans. <laughs> just two gals having a coffee at a Vivans. That's perfect. <laughs> Laurel, for those who live under a rock and do not know who you are. Give us your background, tell us who you are, where you're from, and how the heck you got your start in agriculture. Well, my name is Laurel Isabart. I am a first-generation cattle rancher in southwestern Ontario. Where did we begin? Basically, well, this is, I don't know if we have that much time, Caitlin, but... We have all the time in the world. We have all the time. Where do I start? So, basically... I grew up on the farm that I am on now, 
And I was always the the gal that was like, get me the heck out of here and I'm moving away and never coming back. So I moved to Alberta and then my dad decided to sell a family farm. And so we couldn't pass that up. So we're back here. And then we had a couple kids and then we were like, we should be doing something with this slice of land. And it was always farmed for cash crop, but we decided we wanted to, we had this crazy idea to, oh, we should just get a couple of cows and raise our own raise our own cows for beef for our family, be a little more sustainable. And then that's basically uh, the where everything went a little squirrely, squirrely Dan, because then I got more cows and then I got chickens and then like ponies and a donkey. And then I built a farm store. Wait, I went on Instagram first at some point before that and then built a farm store and then started also a podcast. I think that, is that a pretty vague synopsis of... How I got here? I have to tell you, and I always feel funny saying this. Like I've done my research on you, Laurel. I'm so of scared. All of the things, and I always laugh when millennials say they've done their research, aka they went to Google and <laughs> Googled somebody. And I, I've based my questions on most everything that you've told me, but we're going to dive deeper in to all of the things. Of but Laurel. you Googled me. Oh, I no. Googled you. Yeah. When's the last time you Googled yourself? You know what? I'll be honest. I actually Google myself like once a month. <laughs> <laughs> That's not like a vain thing. I don't think. I think it's more like I'm just monitoring because I am on the internet and you know what? I'm just curious because I've also heard of people. I don't know how to Reddit. Are you a Reddit person? No. Okay. No. People read it and I've heard wind of like snark pages on Reddit. <gasps> you heard of this? No. Okay. I don't either. Anyway, so I, I've seen like creators have people have set up snark pages and it's really mean and really messed up. Anyway, so I wanted to look. So I Google myself to see if I have created a snark, someone has created a snark page. So far, I've not found one. Does that mean you've made it though when people have I those? Think so. Okay. so maybe that's why I'm kind of monitoring to see like when so I... Are you kind of sad you don't have one? I'm a little sad, but also like mental health is happy about that because I don't know. I've seen it about other people. It's so mean. <laughs> We can talk about that on the extended episode. We'll do. <laughs> but let's jump, let's jump back to the farm. So growing up on your where you are today, you wanted to run far away. So you decided to go to Alberta. Uh -huh. Take us on that journey. Well, it kind of started first just like the whole, you know, after high school, the closest kind of major university slash college. Well, we have Lambton College in Sarnia, no shade, but people either went there or they went to London, Ontario, which had like Western University or Fanshawe College. And most of my friend group was either going to Western or Fanshawe and they were kind of basing their post-secondary decision on that and that they were like all together. And I was like, ew, I don't want to do that. Like no offense. So like I went to uh, Windsor, <laughs> which absolute shame to Windsor. Sorry. I hate Windsor. Anyway. So it started really rooted there. That's where I was like, I want to do something different. I don't want to be here. I want to do something different. So that's kind of where it started. And then after many failed attempts of post-secondary things, eventually I linked up with my now ranch hand husband, Andy, and we moved out to Calgary because he was going to do some schooling there. And then we ended up in Grand Prairie, which... <laughs> Also shade to Grand Prairie. No offense, but also to the city itself. I did not enjoy it. I want to talk about your uh, post-secondary uh, interests along the way, because I did the digging and it looks like you were interested in journalism, fashion business, visual merchandising, and then finally landed on veterinary studies slash veterinary technology. Yeah. Or tech not technology, tech, but tech, <laughs> technologist, technician, whatever. Yeah. I, it's funny now, not funny, haha, funny, weird, I guess, but it's interesting now that I can look back on all of those things and see how they made sense or how they all kind of built on each other. But like in the moment, your girl was confused <laughs> because yeah. So right out the gate, I thought I want to, I want to get into journalism because in high school, shocker, I loved fashion. Shocker meaning like most white girls were like, I love fashion, obviously, but I loved the photography 
uh, of like the editorial spreads and my whole bedroom was just plastered in like cutouts of freaking Giselle Bunchen and Prada ads and whatever. And so I was like, okay, I'm obsessed with this and how can I get into this in a realistic way? And I thought, okay, let's do journalism because then I could like sachet into fashion journalism was the goal. <laughs> so yeah, so that's where Windsor University came in and I thought it would be a breeze because, well, it's journalism, like the first intro courses or whatever they're called. It's like English or creative writing. I thought this is going to be a joke because this is what I'm good at and it's going to be so easy and I'm going to crush it, blah, blah, blah. Um, And then I got my first paperback and it was like a D (laughs) or a C. And then that's where it really just like, I could just feel the dream slipping away so, so fast because this was just like absolutely earth shattering (laughs) to realize that, oh, okay, this thing that I thought I was epically amazing at and was literally what I was going to do. Um, I suck at apparently. So then I, I kept trying for a bit. Okay. And then I kept getting papers back and they were just not, not it. It was not it. So then I just straight up quit. You know what I mean? Like I just gave up. I was like, where am I? This is insane. So I just like partied and, you know, enjoyed the the university experience. Um, but then like, yeah, one semester dropped out. Cause I was like, this is not it, but uh, not a quitter. Not really a quitter. Quit temporarily, but then, you know, always have a backup plan. So I thought, okay, how can I still go in this direction, but not in this exact path? So then I found fashion business program in Toronto. So then I went there by myself. Same, same theme, right? Going places alone, which is not inherently a bad thing, but I don't know. I guess that's my toxic trait. Learning lessons the hard way. So then I, yep, I got my fashion business diploma from Toronto And I was like, cool, I'm going to have my own store. And so I went home. I was working three different part-time jobs at three different like retail, small retail stores, boutiques, whatever in my town. And like, I learned a lot because these people who had these small businesses, they were miserable. Not to say this is the same for everyone, but this was just, I was seeing the side of it that like I had always kind of romanticized and I was seeing behind the curtain or whatever. And I was like, oh, okay, so maybe this also isn't awesome. And then H&M showed up to town. And so I was like jumping at the chance for one full-time job with benefits. So hopped over there, a few months in, got promoted. A few months, I don't know. Within the first half year, I guess, I uh, moved up to visual merchandiser slash manager, which was something I thought, oh, sick, I am killing it. This is awesome. And then that's when Andy decided he wanted to go back to school out West. So I just transferred to another H&M out there. And when I got there, I was like, this ain't it. (laughs) Because I'm always looking for the next step up. But then I kind of realized, okay, I feel like I've peaked here. Not that I was at like the top position you could be in the company, but it just felt like even those positions, I was like, I don't want to go there. I I don't want to do this. And then I quit (laughs) and really took a hard look like, okay, what, what actually makes you happy? Cause you're just, you're trying to chase this thing that you thought you had to, had to do to six, to be successful. And so like, it took a really, a lot of work for me to be able to put that to the side and actually look at, okay, what do you want to do that you actually like doing? Like let yourself like, what are you passionate about? And I was like, well, I freaking love animals. <laughs> Shocker. So then I was like, well, why don't I get into, why don't I just go be a veterinarian? So I got a job at a very busy 24 hour animal hospital, emergency animal hospital in Calgary. And I was a tech assistant and it was so wild and I learned so much and I loved it. So then I was like, cool, I'm going to go back to school and be a veterinarian. So then we went to Grand Prairie found a school there that I could work on my undergrad to apply to vet school. And then chemistry just straight up walk, entered the chat and just thwarted my plans because I sucked at chemistry and you can't get into vet school with mediocre grades. So I had, luck, luckily I had that realization pretty early on that I uh, wasn't going to make the cut. So I uh, pivoted again and went to school for vet tech. And then I graduated with that and then moved home to Ontario and did that. Wow. That was a journey. But knowing you, (laughs) this all makes sense now. And this makes sense of where you've ended up. And, you know, 
I think I've shared this story before. In my previous life, I worked in post-secondary education and, you know, I went, I went and got my diploma. I went and got a job and I had benefits and I had all of these things and then pivot to learning to drive a tractor and quitting my job and all of the things. And I remember vividly a conversation that I had with my dad one day as I was driving a rock truck, like a giant Tonka truck down the road with shit in the back manure driving down the road. And I look over at my dad and he's like looking at me. And I said to him, aren't you so glad that you paid for me to go to college (laughs) as I'm driving a shit truck down the road? Uh, And he says to me, Caitlin, as long as you're happy doing what you're doing, it doesn't matter what those experiences, what the cost, all of those things before were because you are doing something today that you love doing. So that's King energy, right? There you there. go. Papa Croucher. He, uh, yeah. He's the real deal there. So, and it's very true because it's hard if you look at it like from that pers- or the perspective of cool, everything I did mm, on paper makes absolutely no sense. And if you think about all the money you spent, ouch, don't think about it too hard. But really, it all, it all compounds on each other. Like for me, I am, like I said, now able to look back and see how. It did make sense. Yeah, it's it's a lot. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. So you moved back to Ontario. You bought the family farm. And then you chose Highland cattle. So the the gap between those things is, so I was working as a vet tech. And then I really wanted to work in large animal practice. That was my thing. Like I really wanted to work with cattle. I really wanted to work with horses. Horse girl at heart forever. But where I live, that position, that practice, there isn't availability. There wasn't any work for me. So I had to do small animal practice, which is fine, but also cats are terrifying. So anyway, and then I went on mat leave with my first, which rolled into mat leave with my second. And at that point, I was like, once I had these two little babies at home, I was kind of like, I don't, I don't want to go back because, you know, the whole dilemma of that is motherhood of mother in the workforce having to choose between your career and thinking about how much it's going to cost to put your children in daycare to work at said career. And for me, the bottom line was like, it was just not worth it because I would just be working 40 hours a week to break even on what I'm paying at daycare. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to stay home then. But I didn't, I'm not like a sit still kind of gal, obviously. So uh, that's when the wheels started turning and we we were kind of like, okay, well, if I'm going to be home, what can I be doing that's still going to contribute? Like I still need, I need, I want to have, feel like I have a purpose other than, other than just being home, which is fine. If that's some, some people are very fulfilled, just, you know, staying home with their kids and raising them and whatever. I'm not, (laughs) I need more. So that's when we were like, okay, well, what if we got a few cattle and I would manage the farm and blah, blah, blah. So that was kind of the jumping off point. And then, yeah, we just kind of were like, well, if we're going to do it. And when I say we, I mean, I do mean me because obviously Andy was cool with like, let's just get some freaking Herefords or a couple Angus. But I was like, well, if we're going to do it, why don't we just do something kind of fun, a little different? Because I'm also like, I love photography. So it's like, it wouldn't hurt for them to be cute to look at. You know what I mean? So yeah, we got three Highland cows two summers ago now. And then now the rest is history. Right. Yeah. So based on what you've told us, the Highland cattle due to their looks was the deciding factor (laughs) on what you wanted to do. So of course I did all the research and everything, but ultimately I'm like, well, that will help me because it's the, it's the, it's fun. I can, okay. You can raise them and we're not like a large scale thing. Right. So like for us, it wasn't about this bottom line turnover has to be quick. Like we didn't care. We were planning to raise them slow anyway. So I was like, well, let's just do something fun then because they're just so prettier. I have to tell you an insider behind the scenes, Mr. Wild Rose Farmer said, at what point was this? can't remember at what point this was. He was like, why don't you get Highland cattle? And I said, what do you mean? Like this was after, after I had my, my Angus 
And he was like, why don't you just get Highland cattle? I was like, why? And he was like, don't those ones look better on Instagram? Self-awareness. I right? love that. Like they, they grow, they grow. So you got the Highland cattle and then you expanded to chickens. Typically it's the other way around. Well, no. Yeah. So yeah, there was always chickens first, actually. It's just then we got more. And then now starting the summer, we... Andy, actually, he's the one who, it was his passion project. He wanted to try his hand at meat birds. So we've been raising broilers, white rock uh, birds this summer on pasture. So yeah, that's him actually. But yeah, no, we did start with chickens, but I think it was while I was waiting for the the cows that I had like put deposits on or whatever is, I, you know, I got bored and I got, got impatient. So then I got more chickens and like two ponies actually before the cattle. And then at some point a donkey showed up and then a Pyrenees dog. And, and then just, you know, it's a whole thing out there. There's so many creatures, but a few cats. I'm not, I don't call myself a cat rancher because there's only three. And I'm not going to ask how many heads you're running because that's impolite, but I do think you have a little more expertise there with the, the cat ranching. Am I wrong? We can talk about it later. Okay. Okay. Um. <laughs> Get ready to join the celebration. The Advancing Women in Agriculture Conference is marking a decade of empowering women in agriculture to thrive, connect, and excel. From November 19th to 21st, 2023, you're invited to join us at the Sheraton Falls View in Niagara Falls, Ontario for the 10th anniversary edition of the Advancing Women Conference East. This event is your opportunity to hear from more than 25 expert speakers and role models in the agriculture and food sector. They'll share their wisdom, inspiration, and valuable insights to help you succeed in your personal life, your farm operation, or your career. As a listener of the Rural Woman podcast, you can use promo code AWCESPL23 to save on your registration. That's AWCESPL23. PL23. For more information or to secure your spot today, visit advancingwomenconference.ca forward slash 2023 East or head to the link in today's show notes. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to celebrate and grow. Join the Advancing Women in Agriculture Conference, where inspiration meets empowerment. So you you started this operation on your family operation. What does your family have to say about the growth of this operation from, from where it started when you and Andy moved back to where it is now? You know what? We haven't really done a, a check-in with Grandpa Shane, my dad, in a bit. But I feel like in general, so before, like, like I said, I grew up on this farm and before me, well, my parents, and then before them, my grand, my dad's grandparents. Nope, my dad's parents. Uh, initially, like they bought this farm originally, so that's why I say like I'm on a first generation cattle rancher on a third generation family farm because we didn't have cattle before. Anyway, so I think for my dad, it's a little more. He's a little more in tune and aware of the changes and whatever because he he spent a large portion of his younger life here. And to see like what we have done with it, I think he is pretty, I would say blown away <laughs> or proud because, you know, I think my grandparents would be really stoked to to see that we've kind of brought it back to sort of what they had it as like they had horses and whatever goats i need goats by the way we'll talk later but yeah i think for them you know what i don't even know how to answer this because it's hard because i don't i think other people in our family never really understood what we were doing if that makes sense so people more involved people in my family that are more involved or aware of egg in general it's more like oh yeah cool other people are just it and I don't understand it. So I don't really, yeah, probably won't go into more detail than that, but that'll start to cost me. It'll be more like family therapy. So, but. yeah. So <laughs> I don't know. I, but this summer you started rotationally grazing 
your Highland. So tell us more about that and how how that's working out and why you made that decision. Yeah, that was a really big deal for us. And again, if you're if you are not involved in egg or uh, not even not involved, but like if you have no idea what that is, then it probably sounds like not a big deal. But so my whole life growing up here, we have a portion of land that's always been farmland and it has always just been farmed for like cash crops, soybeans, wheat, or corn by my my opa, Dutch. He's my Dutch grandpa. He farms like a a large portion of land in our area. So he always just farmed that for us. We basically like rented it out to him, if you will. So we, you know, used to rely on a little bit of a income from that, from that check once a year. And that was nice. And then when we decided we wanted to get the, the, the three cows, it was never, that was not really the plan. It was supposed to just be small. Like we have a barnyard, like that'll be great for the three, but I always, I have an entrepreneurial spirit and I just feel I I took that and I was like, well, let's see what else we can do with it. So then I realized, okay, if we're going to go a little bigger, like we need more space. Like we, like that's not sustainable for us to just keep chucking square bales in here. Like this, when we have a whole field that could, could be pasture. So it took us, took us a couple seasons for us to really like, okay. Uh, all right, let's do it. So we basically like forfeit, forfeit the check and opposite, went the opposite direction and threw a whole bunch of money into actually planting. And we just, we got a, a grant from the government earlier this spring for fencing and we fenced it all in. And that was the huge thing because that is so expensive. Another reason a lot of people close to us or some people close to us didn't understand like, well, why would like, why would you do that? But it's the big picture for us. Cause it's like, well, we want, we want to, it's not just to have the three cattle wasn't just to have uh, more sustainability or t- we wanted to be more connected to where our food came from. And we wanted to show our kids that as well. So that's why we wanted to raise the cattle our own, but we also, it was kind of like a journey we wanted to take ourselves on to kind of reteach ourselves about the same disconnect that we were trying to bridge with our children with food and ag, um, that we wanted to kind of get our own land back to a state of, I don't know what the right word is, but just kind of harmony again and how everything, and we wanted to kind of find a way to coexist in nature and work with nature in on our property versus like fighting it. And so, yeah, we were really, again, Andy was more passionate about, about this. He really, he really uh, took this project on, but we fenced it all in. We have 15 paddocks that we, we have 12 head right now that we rotate. They're on each paddock for just two days and they could probably go on longer, but we are so nervous because it's the first year with the field that we do not want to stress it or strain it in any way. And so we just keep moving it. And actually it's, we've gotten two cuts of hay off it now. And it's so cool to see even just, you can see the biodiversity coming back. I don't even know how to explain it, but like I've lived here for so long, a big portion of my life. And, you know, we've had like wild turkey nests in the paddock and there's wild rabbits. And, you know, we have like a hawk nest somewhere. And it's just cool to see when you are working in like simpatico with with nature that how it all how quickly it can kind of return back to a to its rightful state and you can kind of see the balance coming back even for just not even full full summer yet but that's been really cool to watch for sure as a first generation cattle rancher and chicken wrangler mother wife all of the things What have been some of the biggest challenges that you faced in growing your operation? I think straight off the hop, it's being first generation in ag in general, whatever operation you are running, it's the upfront infrastructure and equipment and all the costs to to get started. I think that was the hardest because and I'm always I'm always like, ah, it and let's short, let's spend money. You have to spend money to make money. And Andy's more like, girl, okay, relax. So it, it's been a good balance in that respect, but it has been hard t- 
taking that leap because you do have to invest. You do have to take a lot of risks to get off the ground. So that's really stressful because yeah, like the fencing, like luckily we did have some version of a barn still standing, but it's just dilapidated almost like it has chickens in it. That's pretty much what we use it for. And then we had to buy a tractor because we didn't have a front end loader. So it's like all these little things that I think that's definitely the most difficult is just you think that, oh, you know, this is a great idea. We can raise a few cows to have beef in our freezer. But it's all the things you need to do that efficiently and properly and in a way that, you know, the animals are healthy and it works for you. It's just, it's just, it's a lot and it can be overwhelming. So I know I've, I get, I get a lot of comments on social about like, oh, how do I get started? Or like, I would love to whatever. And I don't want to sugarcoat it because it's like, no, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't handed down the land, but we, we did purchase it. But also that was a privilege that I knew someone that had, like, it's really hard to buy land to afford land. And then to be able to, you know, plug away and purchase all the stuff that you need to actually start. It's not easy. So I, I don't know. I know some other people, I don't, and I never want to like push them away, away from their dream, but it is a reality that it's going to be expensive probably is my experience. So, well, and you had mentioned something earlier about romanticizing. And I think in the world of egg, especially when it comes to people who are looking to get into it, there is definitely the romanticization factor there because lots of folks are looking at multi-generational operations that have, you know, handed down. And it's not saying that there hasn't been hard work done in between and sacrifices to be made to have that multi-generation of wealth that is there. But it's definitely something that is romanticized and it, it makes, it hurts my heart for these people who all they want is the land and the tractor and the cattle and all of these things. Cause I, I don't doubt that they would be great at it, but it takes a lot to get there. And unfortunately there's a lot of people who won't make it there in 2023 and beyond because unattainable in the society that we live in now. It really is. And I, I, again, with the romanticization, I think it's huge on, I think especially starting, not starting, but it got bigger, I think during the pandemic and and beyond people wanting to be more self-reliant and have more food security and grow their own whatever. And that's awesome. And that's absolutely, absolutely what we need more in the world of. But like you said, it's Unfortunately, it's not realistic for a lot of people. And that does suck because of just inflation and how expensive everything is. It, it's unfortunate. I still hold hope that these people can find a way. But yeah, like I, I know I follow a, a lot of, you know, homesteading and whatever accounts and it's helpful. It, it's inspiring to see like, oh, you can, you can do this. Uh, but I also think it's important to have a dose of reality in there that like, so I, that's why I'll, I will answer those questions in that way rather than like, you, if you can dream it, you can do it because you totally can, but it's going to cost you possibly a, a non-vital Organ, I don't know. It depends on how bad you want to get there. You, I totally believe in you, but yeah, it's just, it's not as simple as a lot of uh, the internet maybe portrays it to be. Well, and you had mentioned like in 2020 when folks were kind of flocking to these rural areas because they wanted that self-reliance. I think it's also important to note that we can't do it all on our own, even as multi-generational farmers or whatever like it's a community reliance in agriculture that i think we really need doing it all on our own isn't sustainable for financial reasons for burnout reasons for all of these things so i think it's you know as we share our stories it's important to say like we can't do it all on our own and we shouldn't have to do it all on our own because 
why would we, when there are other people out there that are experts in their field, why wouldn't we work with them, right? Literally outstanding in their field, right? Yeah, and that (laughs) is, that is the beautiful part for me of social media in general, because that is where, so I, that's where I, I started, I hopped on, I made an account back when we, right, when we decided we were getting the cows, I was like, cool, I'm going to make an Instagram, a public Instagram account for our farm, Isabar Acres, which I didn't say at the beginning, Isabar Acres. Anyway, LOL. I started this Instagram account in a way, in the same way that someone starts posting like gym selfies and stuff for accountability and no shade and not in like no shade, get it girl. But I mean, in a way that I was like, I was not expecting I don't think I was expecting anything. I just wanted to put it out there. And it was a way of like, okay, I'm sharing this and it's scary to share it because it sounds insane, but I'm putting this out there as a way to like keep myself going and not like, so that I can't bail. Like, oh, everyone knows I'm doing it. I'm, I'm going to keep doing it. And then it was wild how quickly I kind of found other people in the same space throughout Canada or wherever the world, globe, whatever, on the internet. And it was very encouraging. and. You know, you just, you think you're doing something that's so original (laughs) and it's not in a good way. Like there's so many other people doing similar things with similar experiences and it's so much better that we can, if we can all kind of share with each other versus competing, I don't know, because how am I competing with a farm in Georgia? I'm not, but just mean like it, it, it's really cool sense of community that I have found online, specifically originally in the ag industry, because I have learned so much from people who have flower farms or they they just raise poultry and whatever. It's really cool when we can all kind of join, be in a community uh, because yeah, there's so much, there's so much. I could not have done a lot of the things I've done. I can't think of a specific example because it's more just little things I've picked up or like even just soaking in just feeling confident seeing someone else doing something that I want to do. I'm like, oh, okay, this can be done. So it has been, it, it has its benefits for sure. <laughs> for sure. What have been some of the biggest wins that you've had on the ranch that you want to celebrate? I think most, most recently, I think our biggest win, like a huge milestone was implementing the rotational grazing system and the pasture and that's still going on because we haven't had a full season. And I I got a drone specifically just to monitor the field from above because it's so cool and we're so proud of it. And it's something that I always, even growing up here, I was like, I'm going to fence in or one day I wish I could have horses in that field. It wasn't cows back then. It was horses. I was working on that. But so beside our property, like a slice of our, our farmland comes up near the house kind of and goes back. So I always was like, oh, I just want, I want a fence there. And I just want to be able to look out the window or drive by and see my horses. And it was very surreal when we actually got that fence in and we we put those cows out into the, into paddock one and there they are right at the front. So that was definitely the biggest win. Previously, I think the, the other biggest thing for us was getting a farm store going on our property. It was something that we, we, I say we, cause we're in this together, but you know, it's, it's me behind that crazy wheel. Okay. And he's just along for the ride holding on for his life. But so our plan was, okay, one day when we have beef to sell, I want to be able to have a farm store to sell it in. And it was at this time I was, I was, I had been selling our free range eggs for a while before we had cows, but it was so much work for minimal reward and just scheduling it and putting them out in a cooler. And then that person not showing up and those eggs being frozen or whatever, because they didn't come. It was just getting really annoying. So naturally I thought, oh, how can we solve this egg issue? I'll just build a farm store. Right. And if you know me, yeah, that makes sense. That tracks. So anyway, it was, you know, that plus the idea of, yeah, we want to have, be able to sell beef when we have beef, which is still like a year away. But I was like, you know what? Let's just do it now. Let's just do it. So I built a farm store and we opened last April and that that was a big deal because we've been nominated a couple years in a row now for these local business awards in our town. And it's just really cool to kind of go from just from, you know, being 
agriculturally related to now also having ties with kind of the local business community. It's just been very cool. Met a lot of cool people. And yeah, that was a big deal for us too. That's amazing. What's next for Isabart Acres? Can I ask? <laughs> I Look, I have a mentee B about this like every eight weeks or I don't know. It's It doesn't come in consistently, but I did have a mild for you like just two days ago. And normally something comes out of that. Like I'll have this crazy idea. And then my toxic trait is I think of this crazy idea and then I'm like, okay, well then let's just do it. But hold tight. There was no crazy idea because we're just, we're riding this out for a little bit because I need to chill. I have a lot of irons in the fire, if you will. Is that what they say? Mm -hmm. But that's okay. So the store is just storing. I do, I do that. I don't really have any, how do I explain this? So I've kind of, I think that's why I started my podcast is because I opened the store. That was my big goal. And then I met that goal. And I don't have crazy plans for the store because I just, that was it. I wanted it to exist. And we do cool things and collabs and stuff here and there with the store, but like, it's good. It's maintaining. So what's next? So then I was like, oh, well, how do I, how do I hook up uh, some podcast coaching with the wild rose farmer? And then, you know, the rest is history in that sense. So then got the podcast rolling. So that's an iron in the fire that I'm still passionate about, still recording and wanting to do stuff with. But like, as for the ranch, I actually feel like we're in a place where it's like, we're just going to let things happen organically because right now we've started the pastured poultry. Maybe we dive into maybe raising some turkeys, who knows? And then we have a, a our bull that we rent. He's coming. He's coming out in a month or so for his little sex vacation, we call it. So we'll get our, our breeding group this year is seven versus we only had three previously. So that's exciting. Our numbers are growing. Just really trying to do all these things, but also find a balance that I can, like my kids are little. So I'm trying to also do all the fun things, but still be very present with them, if that makes sense. Right. So right now I don't, I don't, I don't know. That's, that's it. We're, we're just, this could be your sustainability era. It might be, but talk to me in two months. I may have a new idea, but yeah, I'm feeling, yeah, I guess that's a good, that's true. Talking about it. I do feel maybe I'm, dare I say, chill a little bit right now, which is rare. I'm not, I usually don't contain chill. Right. I want to take a minute to brag on your podcast because I've said this to you multiple times. I liked to relate your podcast to the Rural Woman podcast in the sense of, you know, when we were growing up, we didn't have YouTube makeup tutorials. So we had the orange lines, we had the blue eyeshadow, we had the caboodle case, right? Like that's how we grew up. So I would say that's the Rural Woman podcast. And, you know, we evolved, we changed, we learned how to contour. So we we got better as we aged, right? Got <laughs> right? But the Torbeer Chats podcast like came out looking snatched. So I just want to, again... But you also, you built, you helped... Excuse me. You helped raise the Torbjörn Chats podcast. So that is your doing. Honestly, you did this. You, you made it. So You did it. I, I just guided you, guided you along with all of your great ideas. You did guide me, but in it, like I would not have, I would not have figured it out without you. So thank you. And LOL about the caboodle because that's insane. <laughs> not, not trying to invalidate you, but also you're wild because you clearly are doing amazing things with your with your podcast and you you obviously you inspired me to start my own so if anyone's a caboodle it's me okay i'm the caboodle <laughs> what color of caboodle did you have i don't even know what a caboodle is i didn't even what? have one that's mine was blue and sparkly it was like the plastic hard makeup case that had the two layers i didn't even have like i was such a i don't know tomboy if that's where i didn't get i had a doodle bear does that count a doodle bear not at all Nope. See, that's exactly. See, in this metaphor, I didn't even have a caboodle. That's, where, that's what we're working with. Oh my God. <laughs> Laurel, my last question for you is what is the most rewarding part about being a rural woman for you? I think for me, the most rewarding part is knowing that 
representation matters and being a woman in ag, there are always other women or girls or other little people looking up. And I think it's rewarding to know that perhaps the things that I'm doing may have an effect positively on those other people or younger people specifically. I'm very much almost talking about my my daughter. She's She is my oldest child and she's smiling at me right now like the sweetest little peach. Stop that. Uh, just knowing that I am showing her a different version of the stereotype that I grew up with in society of what it looks like to not only just be a woman in egg, but just a woman in general that, you know, showing her that we literally can do it all or whatever we want. And we are not limited by what people or society tells us we should be doing. That's a whole, that's a whole spiral, but in, that's the gist. We'll, we'll cap it there because I could go off for a bit longer. We can spiral <laughs> on the Patreon extended episode. How's that? Perfect. So if, if you're, if you're ready for it, patrons, we're ready for it. <laughs> Laurel, it has been an absolute delight talking to you today. And uh, I am, I'm grateful to know you and I am proud to call you friend. So thank you so much for sharing your story with us here on the podcast. For those who would like to connect with you after the show, where can they find you online? Well, first of all, the feeling is mutual. And thank you so much for having me on. This is a very surreal experience, truly, because I remember following you and knowing about this podcast. And here I am. It's wild that I'm actually on it and that we're friends. What? Oh, I'll answer your question. Sure. So you can find me anywhere on socials at Laurel Eisebart. I'm going to spell that for y'all. It's Y S E B A E R T. <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, YouTube or basically any social platform, that's where you can find me. And you can listen to the Chore Beer Chats podcast anywhere you listen to the Rural Woman podcast. That too. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you again, friend. I truly appreciate you. Thank you. You too. Thanks for listening to the Rural Woman Podcast. The Rural Woman Podcast is more than just a podcast. We are a community. A huge thank you to the Rural Woman Podcast team, audio editor Max Hofer, and admin support from Kim and Co. Online. A special thanks to our Patreon executive producers, Sarah Reedner from Happiness by the Acre and Carrie Munven from Laystone Farms. To learn how you can become a Patreon executive producer or other ways to financially support the show, head on over to wildrosefarmer.com to learn more. Be sure to hit the follow or subscribe button wherever you listen to the podcast to get the latest episodes directly on your playlist. And if you are loving the show, please be sure to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other platform that accepts ratings and reviews. You can connect with us on social media at The Rural Woman Podcast and with me at Wild Rose Farmer. One of the best ways you can support the show is by sharing it. Send this episode to a friend or share on your social media. Let's strengthen and amplify the voices of women in agriculture together. Until next time, my friend, keep sharing your story. This week's episode of the Rural Woman Podcast is brought to you by the patrons of the Rural Woman Podcast. This amazing group of individuals contribute financially to the Rural Woman Podcast to ensure the stories of women in agriculture hit your earbuds each and every week. Want to join them in supporting the stories of women in agriculture while getting access to extended episodes, patron-only episodes, and other great perks? Head on over to wildrosefarmer.com to learn more about how you can become a patron through Patreon.